Okay. And then with uh, today's topic, we have kind of a part two uh, to our um, early career conversation that we started two months ago. Uh, today's topic, you know, identifying core common skills that a novice RCD systems focused uh, IT professional should prioritize developing as they start their career. Um, so, you know, as we get going on this, uh, Betsy and I will kind of walk us through um, some of the results and findings from last month, um, as well as um, some related works that uh, came up in the conversation from last month, um, and then lead us into some additional conversations today. Um, as you can kind of see hinted across the top of the screen, we are using the Mentimeter again um, to try to make this an interactive conversation that we can have with everybody. So we would encourage you to um, jump onto that. Um, although the, the first questions will be about, I you don't know, halfway through the, the material we have where there'll be kind of an active place to join in. But, you know, cell phones are a great way to do that or, you know, just on your, your machine, whatever you're sitting at. Um, I don't know with that, Betsy, do you want to start off? Sure. All right. Sean. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I think Ms. Brian uh, advances to the next screen, next slide. There we go. So today, some of the things we're looking at is we're going to review um, the current work that we did, but we more, more importantly want to go back and recognize the work that was done that was recognized in our last meeting from the job description, which we'll mention a few times throughout today with that third edition from Essex. And then uh, the work that Jeanette Tiltson did, we're gonna we're gonna be working off of that, trying to jump jumpstart from that in addition to the work that we did in our last meeting. And then once we review that work, we're going to move forward with focusing on now that we have those novices um, within our organization, what do we do to, to get them moving in past that first year or even in that first year? What does that look like? Um, next slide. All right, so today's um, we talked about, we're gonna recap and I think this is a duplicate of what I just said. So maybe we can, it, we again, we'll go over the job description, a summary of the workshop and then a recap and then identify those core skills. So talking a little bit about the workshop training that Jeanette did, um, if you're not familiar with the paper, we do have it in the call doc. It's a, it's a good read to at least initially re review. It really went over three, um, we pulled out three very important bullet items. The research community needs to define how these research jobs differ from common IT jobs. I think we all face that today when we're looking at um, common IT jobs or the um, what I always call the operational side of the house. Those uh, expectations are completely different from research facing in a good way, in my opinion. Um, in the research field, we're looking more to fully develop that person understanding science and, and full capacity of learning how to take care of the users. We're in the com commodity IT side. Sometimes they're only focused on the operational aspect of that. The second thing she had in her work was standardizing on job titles, which we've all um, we've all heard about and talked about. And actually on the CARC, um, on the CARC website, the HR stuff that Scott Yokel and their team have done, they've done some work in this and we will probably continue to contribute to that. Oh, and by the way, I wanna put a plug, which I should have done on a slide or two ago. Um, what we're really looking to have people help us with this commitment. We don't want, we want, I guess at the end, Brian, we'll ask if people want to continue this work with us and what that might look like. Cause we really feel like there's a lot more work we can do here. Um, but we don't want this to be the Brian and Betsy show. We'd really like to branch out and get other people involved. And then jumping back to uh, Jeanette's paper, the third very important aspect was that professional development opportunities are lacking. So if you look at the research com uh, community, there's some really good training things that are out there. Um, I would say, especially pre-COVID, I think during COVID, it became a lot more difficult to do some of these trainings. And now we're starting to see some of them come back. But do all of these trainings really hit what these novices need? Do we need to take a fresh look at are, do different trainings need to be offered? Do we need to say that uh, when we're mentoring early career people that they always get this X type of training so we're consistent across the org consistent across our um, our community. And then once you get that very entry level, 
going to advanced training is almost impossible. So uh, as an example for my organization to get deep storage training is almost impossible to do um, unless you're asking and partnering with the vendor. So can we find better ways to get more advanced training to the people that are starting to move from this, the novice to the next level? Um, are there any questions before we jump to the next slide? I encourage everyone to go ahead and read that paper. It has a lot of really good content in terms of um, the, the problem we still face today, ironically. And that paper was written a, a while ago, which will, we, by the way, we have the citations for that and the other thing we're gonna reference here in a second at the very end of the presentation. So we are acknowledging that work. All right, so the next thing we took a look at was what is a novice system administrator? As it turns out, um, someone from our last meeting mentioned this yeah, USNICS um, paper, which again, we have referenced. I highly recommend you take a look at it. It's a very detailed on what each job description, potentially job description, the, the required skills as you see here, required background, desired and appropriate for each level within the organization for system administrator type people. So it, as you uh, are thinking about growing in your organization and moving people through the different careers, I highly recommend you use this as a reference. And we'll probably start to add, add our own verbiage to some of these as well as posting it on the CARC uh, website. But as you can see, even when this was published in 2012, some of the required skills were strong interpersonal communication skills, which you're gonna see from our results that, that all, all of the things in the required skill area were things that all of you said were absolutely necessary to have as a novice. Uh, that made, um, that kind of confirmed what our thoughts were. That was a really good thing to confirm that what we saw, what we were hearing is actually still true from 2012. Um, the required background said two years of college or equivalent post high school. I wanted to pause for a second to see, do, do most people agree with that? Um, because the reason I asked that is at Purdue, historically, we had always asked for a four-year college degree for novice, and we're really taking a look at that to say, that's not actually what we want or need out of people. So does um, anyone wanna jump in, give us yes, we agree, no, we don't agree, kind of feedback? I will just say that the best system administrator that I know, and no, it's not me, is it has no degree whatsoever. Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to echo that one of the better sysadmins that I've been, had the pleasure of working with also just had a high school degree. I think high school is necessary. Um, you need some level of um, uh, academic rigor, but uh, no, definitely not, uh, not a four-year degree required. Uh, Jim, did you have? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I so I I think you know we talked about this before, Hillary, but I, or Betsy, I I serve on um, lo, the local community college board for their system administration track and for their software development track, and and those guys coming out, you know, after two years, have some really good skills, and we hire a lot of them at Penn State. Great, great feedback. Do we have anyone else that wants to provide feedback before we jump, continue on? I'll pause a second. Dory and uh, another comment were added to uh, the, the chat, kind of agreeing with uh, should not be required. I really like this. Um, speaking for myself, I have no four-year degree. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, John Highmaster, Ohio State. I have managed people from no degree through PhD. And frankly, I can't distinguish based on the degree. I can distinguish a great deal based on the personality, the character, and the enthusiasm of the person. Thank you. Um, Hazma, did I say your name correct? I apologize if I didn't. Um, yeah, it's Hamza. Um, so I'm very new to this. I'm actually a recent sysadmin hire here at George Mason University. Um, so I, so I do have a four-year degree, but not related to sysadmin at all. Um, so I do want to say I think the two years of college for post high school is fine. Um, I was able to pick up everything I needed to know for the job, just based on my own, you know, uh, 
just going out and learning during the work hours and after work hours, I think is doable. Great. Um, Brian, I'm going to collect some of this and I need, uh, if we have other people, I want to kind of keep us moving. We can open it at the end um, because we do have the survey stuff we would like to get through. But this has been really great discussion. Some of the desired background and skills, um, certificate programming. So Brian and I had a really detailed conversation about um, not only could we look at this from the lens of a, a, a formal degree program, but could we start to think about more of a certificate program or badging program that allows people to enter our field in a more inclusive, low uh, barrier, enter to bear, barrier to entry. And so we want to also kind of drill in on that as we continue this discussion. Do those kinds of things happen? Uh, are, are they available and what do they look like? And would those candidates just be as successful as someone with a two-year degree? Um, then the appropriate responsibilities perform routine tasks under the direct supervision and then acts as a frontline interface to users accepting trouble, um, accepting trouble reports and, and things like that. So the, when we looked at the novice system administrator, um, we conceptually agreed with, based on the feedback that we got, that we're going to show you in just a second, that most of this rings true. And again, I want to just kind of reiterate, this is from 2012, so um, that goes to show us that these, these soft skills are, are very important for the success of the organization. So now as we uh, recap from the August meeting. Betsy, do you mind if I throw in a few comments here? Oh, yeah. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead. So, so I, you know, I think Betsy touched on this, but just to kind of make it clear, one thing about this Usenix, uh, you know, reference that we pulled the novice system administrator from is just recognizing this is a generic Unix, you know, novice system administrator kind of job description, not necessarily tuned to an RCD type environment. And so that's one thing as you look through that paper um, is I think they're trying to be a, a very applicable in, in the general sense so that there can be some distinct differences that maybe you know for our types of positions we may think well it needs a little bit here or a little bit there adjustments but but by and large we were surprised at how much overlap um you know the the base description represented for a novice level person and, and that was promising yeah thanks brian good point okay so now recap from the august meeting the very first question if we can forward is what skills we asked you what skills are required for an early career RCD professional? And the answers we got were overwhelmingly um, soft skills. So I, I know that this is a little bit of an eye chart, but as you see at the top, we have the, um, the it, soft skills are in green. We had 27 skills listed with 61 votes. We had 13 technical skills listed with 49 votes. But predominantly what we see is that these soft skills take a very heavy, um, are, are really what people are looking for, which we just confirmed. And then the other interesting thing we wanted to maybe pause and talk just a little bit about is what we saw was predominantly Linux and maybe scripting and troubleshooting were the other very, very important things. So we would even include networking in there. So we were thinking the top four things that rang out or Linux scripting, troubleshooting, and networking. And I want to pause for just a second to tell you, as we looked through the word cloud, Brian and I made some assumptions, if you will, about different words that we consolidated. But Brian, I, I guess I would like you to follow that up. We didn't yeah. consolidate we, dramatically, we, right? We looked through for things where people said approximately the same thing and kind of combined them where there seemed to be enough distinction to leave them separate. We left them separate. Um, uh, we do have all the raw data if anybody else would like to look at that and they can see kind of the actual wording used. But so so this is a little bit of a, a, a collapsed, um, but the, the the quantity of votes still represents the number of votes in these areas. In some ways, I think as Betsy was saying, it was uh, interesting to just see the focus being heavily on, more heavily on the soft skills than on the, the hard skills for the novice level. Um, Although, as we saw with the Usenix, uh, you know, novice system administrator, that was there as well. Um, I don't know. I think we're kind of curious. Anybody have any thoughts or feedback to throw out kind of from this perspective before we move on to the next question from last month or not last month, last meeting? Yeah, Tim. 
So when you say uh, Linux, do you mean uh, sysadmin Linux or, you know, researcher are using Linux, you know, from a, uh, a researcher perspective, they can do a whole lot, you know, as a as a user of the system, but that can be very different than administrating a system, which is a whole set of different skills and knowledge and things like that, you know, running a program versus, you know, debugging system D issues or Pixie or all those kind of things are different. So, so that's that's a good question, and I guess I what I'd say is based on how people answered, I don't know that they gave that clarity um, for in the answers. So we just simply represented it as much as we could based on what people gave us. I guess it's I guess it's if it's early career, it's early stuff and all those things. I think if if I I would agree. This. But this is where the community should vote in, because again, we made some assumptions about some of this from my perspective the way i um the way i took the answer was really they just need to have that basic linux system administration skills and we'll teach them everything else yeah so slide it, on. Uh, go ahead yeah go ahead. i was going to say if there's any other final notes we'll move on to the next one um, but i do want to park one question that Sai asked that i want to make sure we follow up on because he did ask a really good question um Based on HR rules, does someone without a degree have a career path? So Brian, let's hold that one and we'll we'll see if we can generate some conversation about that as we get through these slides. All right, so what's the second question we asked is what skills are the hardest to find in a candidate or to develop in new hires? And again, overwhelmingly, we see that this is, um, now we're starting to see networking, troubleshooting, um, security compliance. And as we notice, like Linux actually starts to drop down, which makes sense because we assume that once again, they had that coming in. But uh, I, I would like to direct your attention to once again, we see soft skills still has 23 skills as opposed to technical skills have 17. So as we start to see what's hardest to do, I think that we have a flip that is saying, well, if we haven't acquired these these skills in the novice that we hired, they're gonna be pretty difficult to teach, uh, at least some of the communication soft skills. So that was one of uh, my takeaways. Uh, the other takeaway is um, understanding this networking and troubleshooting and security compliance. One of the things we would like feedback on are, do you know in the community, are there good ways to get this networking, troubleshooting, security compliance, education what are people doing which we will hit very heavily later but i don't know if if we just want to take a couple seconds here to say um what are you doing in your organization to to teach some of these hard skills is anyone doing anything or is this an area as a community we should be developing jim do you have your I, yeah um so we we have a, a mentoring program you know, so where we pair up a, a more senior person, usually in another organization throughout IT at the university with with a, a novice. And that that's gone pretty well. We also um do some you know, do some things like um uh, job sharing, which has been a good experience. So, so somebody would like to acquire cloud skills or whatever, and they're in, they're in a, a more traditional uh, HPC sysadmin job, they can sort of partner with our cloud team for, you know, up to 10 hours per week for about a six month period and, and sort of shadow the person that's doing the, you know, the HPC and the cloud work. And, and that's proven pretty well, people, you know, it, and and there's actually been very little poaching, which we're kind of happy about, you know, where somebody starts to work for one organization is like, oh, let's hire this guy. So th there, there's been very little poaching in that area, which is what one of the things that we were originally worried about. Very good. Um, so if, if folks would like to drop in um, training that they know about that could cover these three areas, we would love to be able to post that and support that in our community. And if we find that no one has good um, good recommendations, this might be an area where, again, we might help in the community and start to develop some of these trainings for people. Because as we think about this, it's in our best interest to, get, to do this as a community to try to find ways to get networking, especially networking. Um, troubleshooting, I, I, I think there's different ways you can do that, but networking was one of them that we were struggling just to say, okay, if we had a reference, what would that look like? 
Um, any final questions or Brian, did you have anything to add before we move to the next slide? No, I think I think we should move on. Yep. OK, um, what are all right? So what additional lacking or emerging skills should new team members focus on in developing next? And well, what we saw from the go ahead, if, Brian, if you don't mind, just let me start off here. So it's so one of the things that we found intriguing is these three core sets of questions we asked you guys last time. You know, it, they take a transition, you know, if you observe this with us, our first one, what should they have to get in the door was heavily soft skill focused. Um, what are the hardest ones to acquire was a little bit more even balanced in the middle, but still with a higher quantity of soft skills, you know, in the in the list. And here we are, where should they go next? Um, you know, here we invert and become very heavily technical skilled. So this will bring somebody in that doesn't necessarily you know, very high end on the, the technical side, you know, which fits the novice position. But there was a lot more emphasis on the, the soft skills. Now we want them to learn the technical. So, so you'll see that as we go forward, we're going to ask questions kind of asking, you know, what your thoughts are. Um, so I'll turn it to Betsy, but I see um, there is a, a comment here in chat if somebody would like to chime in. Feel free to. Um, hey, so I did just uh, drop it in the chat, but uh, sorry, uh, all I wanted to share was um, I agree with the networking aspect. It's not something that um, it, it varies depending on what their skill level is with it. I come from a background in networking, which is what peaked uh, Mason's HPC team um, and when they saw my resume. I came in and I was able to handle most of their InfiniBand and networking troubleshooting as I came up to speed with the sysadmin daily tasks. Um, so I think it's doable. And again, I just wanted to chime in just to say I agree with the research you all have put together. Great. OK, um, Brian, I don't know that we had additional things for this slide. Does anyone have any? Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. I did. Uh, I jumped the gun a little bit in the chat, but uh... I'm seeing Windows, uh, you know, a longtime manager of sysadmin teams, currently manage Linux and Windows. Any re research computing I toss to the Unix team, more and more I'm having to go to the Windows team and say, oh, here's here's a user or here's a problem. So uh, for an emerging skill, uh, I would uh, I would think Windows, uh, I'm just starting to see it more. Uh, mm -hmm. Never thought I would, but it is. <laughs> it's, it's funny you say that. Brian, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'll wait. Go ahead. Well, it's funny you say that because we um, we are getting more and more, um, especially in, around our window or our security, our secured uh, assets. People want to use Windows environments to use it, and of course, we're not a Windows shop, and so it's been pretty much a non-starter for our organization. Brian, I, go yeah. ahead. So the comments I was going to throw out is, is similar to what you're saying there. If you look at these top five or six. Uh, you know, blue lines here in this list. Um, they seem to be on new emerging areas, right? Um, or still relatively new emerging areas. Um, you know, some of the compliance, security, containers, uh, cloud, you know, kind of areas. Kubernetes is, is not too far from this as well, right? So, so, you know, these new emerging things, which I think can include, you know, the emerging uses of the Windows you know, environments. And then when you go look at the standard system admin, these stuff, um, they, they seem to be more in the middle. And then our, our small ones down here at the bottom, some of them get a little bit more specialty. You know, the TensorFlow comment was, you know, added in, Jupyter. Um, it, it's, it, it's interesting what people were calling out as the, the hunger points of what we need to develop skills in. Um, yeah, very good. We'll jump forward. So, so here's where we're going to get ready to kind of make this a bit more interactive. So if, if you haven't, uh, and we'll get a slide in a moment where you'll be able to see it a little bit better, but uh, the menti.com and then you can jump in with this code that we have up here. Um, in a moment, there will be a QR code that will come up on the screen as well that we can use. Right here, actually. So We'll give you just a moment, if you haven't, to give everybody a chance.
again, you can get to it just by going to the URL listed at the top and using the code as well. So I'm going to go ahead and advance from here. So, so this perception here that we're, we're going to bring with the first question really comes around the idea that the, from that first question of what it took to get somebody in the door, what a candidate needed to have to be eligible or, or to be a good candidate uh, for a novice position. Um, so we're, we're kind of curious why people feel this, the results may have turned out this way. So the next question when I jump over here um, is a multiple choice question. And, and the idea here is you can select all that apply. Um, you'll notice that there is the option for other something that, that we didn't list. Um, we'd love to have people participate and kind of you know, click as many of these that, uh, that apply to them. This is so cool because it's kind of like I said, Brian and I have been working on this for quite a while and we've been making a lot of assumptions and you guys, this is really confirming some things we've been thinking about. Yeah. I actually expected uh, a, a little bit more behind the budget one, but uh, <laughs> mo most of the votes are kind of landing somewhat as I kind of expected. Um, it, I guess we felt pretty good. We don't so far have a disagree. <laughs> we had to put that one out because, you know, did we misrepresent something from somebody's perspective? You know, we would like to know that. Um, and we thought about doing this as a word cloud, but the idea of the answers you guys might give us uh, on, on the responses here, we, we thought that would be kind of like maybe how uh, Tim was talking about Linux as a skill, was that as a user, we were worried that a, a word cloud would make it too hard to like understand the context of the answers. Um, so hopefully this was an acceptable way to kind of uh, prompt you guys for this information. So we'll give this just a few more seconds before we close this one and then move on to the next one. Um, and, and Brian, do we want to investigate the some other reason not listed or? Wait? Actually, sure. If, if anybody who did vote for the other is willing, we'd love to you know invite you to unmute um, and maybe you know express some of the ideas of the things that we did not capture with the rest of the options. It, it looks like Dory has her hand up. Dory? Yeah, the reason I pick that um, is because for us, um, we can't necessarily hire someone with very specific technical skills. We want someone with a broad range. And so we generally focus more on the soft skills and where they would fit in with, with our group. You know when we can hire people, which has been not in the last fifteen years. So I'm probably the, uh, the wrong person to be talking about this. <laughs> no, this is great feedback, I, uh, Brian. I think that kind of summarized what you were trying to articulate that we just couldn't get words put to. Uh, Jeff, did you have a some feedback? Yeah, I chose that as well, and, and one of the reasons I did it is I just think, particularly in an academic environment, navigating the policies and the interactions and all that, that's peculiar to academia is a really important soft skill to have that you may not necessarily see in the private sector. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna close voting on this one and let us move on. So, so now this kind of builds into one of the comments that, that was shared earlier. Um, 
Well, I, I, we'll get to the one that built in. So, so, so th this one really is specifically kind of asking the question of what approaches do you, your institution use to help motivate novice system admins to grow and develop the skills that they need? So, so this one we will be doing as a word cloud. So I'll go ahead and move forward onto this one. Um, we're trying to capture the ideas of, of how, you know, each of us, you know, as individuals or as our organizations try to motivate new admins to not just hit the requirements of their current that's an interesting very first answer <laughs> um, how, how do we how do you motivate people to not only you know hit the marks of their position but to then go beyond that to develop the skills that will take your group forward Again, like as, as we're thinking about this question, one of the things that Brian and I have been trying to think about is if there's not a um, a way to help early career people today, because, you know, technical people don't equal good leadership all the time. Is there's another opportunity that our community can start to build these mentorships and ways to help support these early career people as they're going through uh, going through that first couple years or whatever it takes. Um, so I think that we're just trying to drive like, is there someone out there that's doing some really great things we should be talking about? But I really like these, uh, I really like these answers. Uh, they resonate really well with me. Pay increase, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. There's a vendor neutral one. Um, I'm I'm interested in that question. If someone would want to drop in the chat, uh, what what you're if you're willing to share what that one means, have a knowledge base. That's a good one. I I really actually quite like the freedom to make mistakes. We, we yeah. end up discussing this around here of um, it may not fit every circumstance that you have in a production environment, but you want to let people have that opportunity to take the, the, the guardrails off. Um, because sometimes those mistake moments are the most insightful and, and learning and, and growth promoting moments uh, for somebody. I put in break things for you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> that covers it. I like uh, Ryan's comment, just culture. It's in the chat. I see workshops is starting to form, which is really good. You know, you know, at the at the back of my mind for a lot of this is somebody who's you know none of this is profound and new. I think we all understand this, but somebody who enjoys their job um, is more likely to be more productive, uh, a longer lasting employee. You know, barring certain um, you know monetary aspects of things that can you know get in the way. But if you can engage somebody and and have them enjoy what they're doing, I, I, you know, obviously we, we get ahead. Another thing that Betsy and I were talking about yesterday or the day before yesterday, actually, when we were kind of trying to um, wordsmith a few of these things is kind of that idea of um, helping somebody understand what the thing they're working on, how it fits into the bigger picture sometimes becomes really key in helping somebody understand the value of the, the thing that they're working on and, and often can translate to, you know, better job satisfaction. Which, which I think then helps in that motivating somebody to, you know, continue to develop themselves on what they're doing and maybe then become interested in other things as well. And, and Brian, I don't know if you're watching this, but we talked, Brian and I talked a lot about is pay one of those things that help motivate people. And I'm so glad to see that that is not the top two or three things coming because I think if you're in a university setting that's a challenge in and of itself. 
but I think this goes with the comment about the academic culture too um, yep. that was shared earlier. You know, there is a culture also related to this that you know some people have passion for. Um, not everybody will. Okay, let's give this maybe another 20, 30 seconds and then we'll wrap this one up. Brian has another nice comment in the chat. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how I feel about that comment. <laughs> University leadership would rather funnel money to the executive leadership than IT or academic. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to close voting. If anybody's right in the middle of typing something, um, feel free to poke me. I can open it back up. Um, I'll let you finish what you're adding in. But we'll close this and move on to the next slide. All right. So our next one is which mentoring? So this is going to play in with a lot of the comments that have been being shared and some of the answers. But which mentoring, training, networking opportunities are most effective? to help integrate your novice admin into your team and the RCD community. So again, this one is a, a word cloud opportunity for us here. So, the, so this is us trying to pull, what do you do locally? What do you in, in have your staff, you know, team members engage in and the community, you know, at a large level that you find effective for providing these mentoring training networking. And um, preferably the more specific you could be, the better that will help our findings. So for instance, if you say you send them to Perk SysPro, yeah, very good. Um, if you could be more specific or training saying LCI training or something on that end, because what, again, what we, we really want to use this as a uh, sort of as a reference to help start to build curricular uh, products for our group. So I'm not looking to bias the answers with this, but I am kind of intrigued with within the, you know, the, the community. I know there's a number of regional efforts. Um, do they play a role here, you know, for anybody? Five boxes and an open HPC manual. I love that. <laughs> we did something similar. We tried something similar last summer. We had our early career people basically stand up a cluster sort of on their own and the, the uh, leaders were available for question answer. And it's amazing how much I think that group of people learned over that period of time. Uh, Tim, I think you have a question. Uh, just another comment. Uh, we inherited two racks of old um, exchange uh, storage, and it was fortunate that it was from I think 2012, the time when uh, some tsunami went through, so it had really high uh, drive failure rates. 
so the sysadmins had lots of fun playing with different uh, storage systems and you know drives would fail left right and center but they got to see all kinds of different failure modes that you wouldn't see uh, if you actually had uh, high quality drives so they they had absolutely a blast on it um, and it it uh, allowed us to, to build our next gen gen system so enterprise was very useful for giving us their uh, you know just out of warranty boxes to, to play with uh, for infrastructure and, and experimentation hmm. Um, before we go to Jim, and Ryan also adds, which I think is important to, um, to pull out, one of his, one or two of his newest members um, that are not handy to talk said they they went to SC and it went over their head as an admin new to HPC. Um, I I think that that is totally understandable depending on what they could find at HPC beyond SysPros, because um, the SysPro track I think is pretty decent, but beyond that. Um, what are the kinds of trainings that SC offers to sysadmins? Um, my feedback from my team is it's pretty, it's it's pretty lacking. So I I, I would I totally agree with that, Ryan. Uh, Jim, what did you have to say, or what? So, so similar to Tim, when I used to teach system administration class in the business school, we we got old lab handoffs, you know, basically things that were in in the lab, particularly in the sort of the engineering lab. So they were high-end Unix workstations and we got them, we put them in a virtual network and, and you know, let the kids. So I had loaded system images onto them that purposely broke certain things and they had to fix them up and they had to get them ready and, and secure them. And, and most of the feedback was, well, the, the final project was the greatest part of this course, you know, I wish we had done this all, all year long or whatever, but you know, obviously they didn't have the skills at the time to do it all year long, so. So I really like Tim's comment. Um, I think it captures my view of, of SC as well. Um, experience networking and it and the workshops are all key. I find SC is also good sometimes for some of the vendor connections. Um, you mm -hmm. know, that's part of, I think, the networking statement. Um, but one thing that I think the, I'm, I'm I'm reading my opinion into the, the word cloud here a little bit, but I think years and years ago, I found a lot more value kind of at SC looking at the tutorials than I think I find now. Uh, and that's not to talk specifically about, you know, whether those tutorials aren't advanced enough for what I'm looking for or don't cover the material I want. I, I think Perk is doing right now a little bit better on some of the things they're offering it's more of what I remember SC being like from those tutorials and, and the level of some of the material in the technical program that I think is more friendly to a younger, you know, uh, person career wise um, than I think SC. But SC has a lot of good information. I think you just have to spend a lot more time reading what each tutorial or each workshop is going to cover for you or each of the presentations within the technical program. And you have to go cherry pick and then you're really challenged because there's almost always too much to do for the time that you you have available to you okay so i think we've probably given this a let to maybe betsy kind of take us back through any comments that we've missed but i think we're getting close to wanting to close the results here so let's give it another i don't know maybe minute at most betsy you got anything more in the comments you want to go back over um, I think the only thing that this, I think again, that what this brings to our attention, Brian, is the, the one formal training I see, and maybe I'm missing something here, is the Linux Cluster Institute. So it, this it's might- It's twice. Yeah, so it, this might be like an area, or oh, there's also the OU virtual residency. Um, so I, I guess there's a couple areas we could look to see, again, supporting the community. Are there other, um, other types of training we can do because I think um, from my experience, unless you have a bank of uh, seasoned mentors, uh, being able to mentor your early career people becomes very, very difficult unless you have a bench. And my, again, from the feedback from this community, it seems like there just isn't a bench. So then if beyond having a bench to help job shadow and, and uh, which I love all of these ideas, and doing some of that mentoring, it seems like the community needs to have more of more opportunities to do mentor across the community and provide um, more formalized training. I'd like to get some feedback on that, unless I'm just completely reading this 
this wrong here. So the last comment, smaller shops have to find content that is suitable to the needs of their smaller cluster and researchers in those environments rather than the national labs. Um, I would like to maybe probe that a little different. Um, and maybe I don't completely understand your organization, but um, I guess from my perspective, when we're trying to train our early career people, a cluster is a cluster. I think the difference is, is what, you know, is it Finiban or what are you using? Again, um, talking about networking. Um, it, can we can we agree that there's probably some very base level uh, tutorial slash training that would be, um, and maybe we can't, but could be useful across all sizes of organization. I don't know, what, what are people's thoughts there? Well, I'm just throwing out a little bit. I think that's part of what LCI is attempting to do, right? Um, especially with the, the intro uh, version of their curriculum. Um, but but maybe I'm reading into this last comment into the, the chat, kind of some of my own feelings from before, but I remember going to a number of the community events and, and I mean this with no criticism at all, but just more kind of, sometimes you're hearing the presentations be about the grand challenge problems that fit the large scale end. And it's hard to see how that, how to relate that back down to you because the material was focused on what they were presenting on. So I think, I, I, I kind of wonder if, if maybe a way to look at this is to make sure we look at things from that small shop where often people wear many hats. Um, and, and needing to make sure that, that the material can be ingested in a relevant fashion, as well as giving opportunity to talk about the larger, more grand scale, you know, challenging situations. Yeah, yeah Ryan's got a good comment here as well. Okay. Uh, Betsy, I, I don't know how, how old uh, some of you people are on this call, but when I was uh, first starting as a system administrator many years ago, I used to go to the Usenix uh, SAGE events, and I, I don't even know, it looks like SAGE is kind of wound down, but it was the System Administrators Guild, and they had some excellent tutorials on networking and storage and and, and you know, that would both be relevant to system administrators and you know, where we have to serve multiple roles, but also to HPC and sort of large enterprise system administration. So that that's where I got a lot of my formal formal training in system administration. And do you felt that would be more useful than what we're seeing today where people are saying, um, or maybe it's just not available today, per going to conferences, virtual residencies, do you feel like um, that approach probably helped you jumpstart it? Or do you feel like going to conferences can also help? Those were those were conferences, but there were also booklets and tutorials. The, the most valuable thing was the tutorial days before the conference. There'd be like two days of tutorials and, you know, half day and full day. And those were really good. I don't know if we want to, oh, we didn't do like a thumbs up, thumbs down on this one, but I'm wondering, um, is this an area people would be uh, interested in helping us further the work here? Um, again, we would look at the things that are already available, the, which we talked about, the Linux Cluster Institute. Um, there's the virtual residency. I need to do more homework on that. But are people um, interested in helping us further this in terms of what could be available in the community and get one kind of common place that's non-biased of these are the materials that people can use. Please somebody say yes. <laughs> I, I'm always willing to help out whatever that kind Go of ahead. thing is. Go ahead, Kyle. No, I just said I'm always willing to help out, you know, things like this. I, I enjoy that that type of thing. Great. We promise not to make it painful. So I'm going to go ahead and close up voting on this slide and let us advance to kind of the, the last slide 
um, which really kind of lets us open for just general discussion. But this is also um, re references for the two uh, um, you know papers that we were pulling from. Jen uh, sorry, Jeanette's uh, paper there, uh, URL listed, as well as the um, USENIC's uh, um, job descriptions for system administrators. But this this is the end of the questions that we have for today. Uh, we'd really like to open any of the remaining minutes just for any general comments, questions, you know, reverting back to some earlier part that we skipped over that that you'd like to, you know, add more to. And do we find this conversation useful? Do you should we continue the conversation, continue to provide things? Uh, we really don't want to do things that are not useful for the community. So we, I guess, I think we would want to get a little bit of feedback regarding that as well. One thing I, that I haven't seen mentioned here is SIFTED. Are, are you familiar with SIFTED? CCIFTD, I believe it is. It's uh, Henry Neiman started that. It's, it's a certificate, a uh, badging sort of HPC research computing uh platform i guess you'd call it and uh we talked about it at perk this year and it looks to be very promising some of this very same kind of thing that we're talking about for training especially for younger people and and for showing that you have those qualifications right so remind or correct me if i got this wrong i thought that the early view of that was mostly going to be focused around the soft skills and not the technical skills i thought it was both Okay, but, that was but, my understanding. Of it. Maybe I, maybe I was wrong, but that was my understanding. Of it. So I agree with you. So I didn't I didn't hear it with the acronym way you said it. But I was I was at one of the presentations where he shared information about it, and it does sound interesting. And I don't know if I'm blurring the conversation with something else where he was talking about initial focus on some of the soft skills. Here, I'll put a link in the channel. I just found it here. Okay, thank you. It's heavily in development right now. Um, right. Henry, Henry has his his um, virtual residency calls, and they're working on the content and the, the infrastructure right now. So um, I don't know what state it is. I haven't attended those for a while, but um, yeah, that's that's where you can go to get involved with that. So it's conceptually think, some of the things we were kicking around here was if we had a set of materials we could just use, like. I don't know, we, we provide a clusters 101 on campus. If you had a set of those kind of instructions we could share across the community, then it becomes more of an on-demand rather than in that first year, that person's already scheduled pretty heavily in so many other things, just trying to acclimate themselves to the job. So is there a way we can provide more on-demand kind of training we can share throughout the community? So part of me would want to go in and look to see if there's not a way to engage with LCI kind of on that because again LCI and maybe some of these other uh, things have been brought up the HPC residency, which I don't know enough about. Um, maybe some of our emphasis could be is to, to reach out to those groups try to collaborate yeah. with them and see if there's not an opportunity to either expand the material they have or see about having some of their material available in this on demand kind of fashion. Uh, John Highmaster again. The one thing I have not heard discussed is teaching research culture, teaching them, teaching the people what motivates researchers, what their priorities are and are not, the research life cycle, uh, the world of episodic funding as opposed to sustained funding. These are all things that shape the uh, the customer's view of the world, and I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. I would wonder virtual if that's residency. a big match to the virtual residency or to Henry's new project. Go ahead with whoever was going to. No, no I was just I was just saying the same thing you did. Virtual residency covers that in great detail. Yes, and uh, it needs to be it needs to be done. Yes, Henry does a great job with that, but the, the typical student doesn't see that. A typical um, trainee doesn't see that, and we need to make sure that they do. Yeah. Right, so it's it's in fact what you're you're hitting on here is is there's a lot of observations I've made over the years of a particular person who maybe kind of looks at a 
a presentation or topic and it doesn't look like it's supposed to be in their main wheelhouse and so they don't invest the time in it so part of this is maybe us doing a better job of advocating for people to spend the time on some of these topics that we're training opportunities that that backfill in these important perspectives um awarenesses to bring things in tim's got your, your hand up yeah, I'd even go so far as be being prescriptive and say, here's a plan. So um, the first year you go to, to PERC and SC, no matter what, what you're doing, just to get the experience, um, you attend uh, the uh, Henry Neiman's virtual residency. You know, if you're systems facing, then you, you go to the LCI uh, and a couple other things where it's it's very prescriptive in terms of what you should do. And, and I think that would help give folks that have problems or difficulties or challenges in budgeting, you know, training above and beyond, um, uh, you know, the typical things that you would see within enterprise IT. Um, you know, they'll often spend $18,000 to uh, train a PeopleSoft administrator, but uh, at the same time, won't let folks go to, 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 to a, you know, a $2,000 conference. So just by having it, you know, something that is recognized within the community uh, might be able to help with, uh, with budgeting for some folks. So we are okay. at the top of the hour and we want to be mindful of everybody's schedules and that you likely have another meeting, you know, within moments. Um, we really do appreciate everybody's contributions today. Um, we'd love to encourage if there's more to, to discuss, let's take this to, you know, the Slack channel and, you know, continue it there. Um, we can also uh, schedule a future meeting if there's more material to, you know, cover um, that would make a, a meeting worthwhile. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.